First of all, hello to everyone joining my speech about graphic innovations at Infineon's Taveo second generation MCU. My name is Volker Dastes, I'm 43 years old and I'm working as product application engineer at Infineon for the EMEA region. Please don't hesitate to ask your questions in the chat box during my presentation. Let us start with the agenda. We are already half through the introduction. And in the next slides, I will give you some background information about Traveo second generation cluster MCUs. The largest part of the presentation will be the technical part. First, we, we, we will go through a typical use case and look which hardware units are involved. And then we take a look on the Taveo 2 features to minimize video RAM usage. The fourth point is about why are most customers using HMI tools. And the last one is about Infineon's HMI tool certification program. So where do we come from? Taveo first generation MCUs with body and cluster were released by Cypress Semiconductor. The Taveo first generation was and still is very successful in the market. And now we are releasing the second generation MCUs. The body parts are already in serial production. The cluster parts are following now. Infineon and Cypress merged in 2020. Therefore, you see the Infineon logo in this presentation. On the right side, you see some applications which could be enabled by Taveo graphic MCUs. So for automotive, typically an instrument cluster or an head-up cluster, HVAC systems. Interesting is also, for example, here the matrix LED headlights or digital mirrors. On this table, we will not stay long, but nevertheless, I want to show you the Port, um, MCU portfolio we have in the meantime with Infineon and former Cypress parts. The TC3X is the Infineon AUX family. T2G means Taveo second generation with the extension B is body. This here is a body high part. The down left is the body entry part. And we speak today about the T2GC. So the cluster part with the um, example applications we spoke before. Cluster, head-up display, digital mirror, and so on. Uh, this table gives a more detailed overview about the different cluster variants we have. We concentrate today on the graphics MCU mentioned here. This In this MCUs, our own developed graphic IP is in. On top is the CYT4EN, in which the video RAM is connected to an LPDDR4. This is out of scope for today. We will concentrate on these two variants here, the CYT4DN with 6 MB memory size and 4 MB video RAM. The little smaller Variant is a 3DL with 4 megabyte flash size and 2 megabyte video RAM. On this table here, you can see the different uh, cluster sizes um, we can support. Here on the lower end, we have uh, the typical hybrid clusters, then the first digital clusters, and then up to full HD sizes. As mentioned, the Traveo second generation cluster MCU integrates an own developed graphic IP, including video RAM, and we work with low power ARM uh, CPU chips. The graphic IP itself offers a 2.5D graphics engine, drawing engine, display engine with in and out and JPEG decoder. Maybe a word more to the uh, wording of 2.5D engine. So, this is a 2D engine, so an image is stored as X and Y, which uh, gives a lot of advantage to the much uh, larger and more costly 3D engines. Uh, but nevertheless, we allow certain 3D operations. A typical one is, for example, you have an image and rotate it over a virtual set axis. Um, this can be used to, to simulate um, 3D-like animations, we will uh, 
see an example of this later on. We still see a lot of cost and uh, complexity advantage of our MCU compared to SOC or cockpit domain solutions. This already brings us to the technical part. Um, before we go in, here a short video from QT itself using our CYT4DN. Um, at the beginning, we see a 1920-70-20 display. I will directly stop here shortly. You see here in front a um, cover flow, which is dynamically created. So you have 2D uh, images of the covers. And then you have this uh, rotation also around the set axis um, to simulate this, this 3D-like effect. And you run it a little bit longer. Um, it switches between different rotations. Um, so here you can see, for example, very nice the 3D effect. And here you can also see this example um, created with our HMI tool certification program, which we will uh, talk about at the end of the presentation. But now back to the technical part. Um, in the next slide, we will take a look on the architecture block diagram. Then we will go through this typical use case to show you um, how our hardware is working. And in the end, we will clarify what is meant with LBO or OTF and how this helps us to create complex scenes, even with a limited video. This is the block diagram in gray. You have the normal MCU design, right? So you have your two, in our case, two CPUs, Cortex M7s, Cortex M0, Crypto, RAM, and uh, typical uh, automotive peripherals like uh, LIN or CAN or Ethernet. But today we concentrate on the graphic subsystem with an own interconnect or 2.5D engine, vector engine, video RAM, and video in and video out. Okay, now we will bring content to the display. For this, we take in our example and background a needle to indicate the current speed. So this needle would then be needed to be on top of this uh, background. And for sure, we need a display to bring this all on. So the display can uh, either be an RGB or an LVDS uh, display. The CYT4DN variant support up to two displays or one larger dual LVDS display. In our example here, we have just one LVDS display connected. Then the graphic uh, assets needs to be stored. The background is a typical, um, a typical uh, fixed and not changed background content. Therefore, it is uh, normally stored in an external memory, for example, and hyperflash. The needle itself, it's uh, for sure much more dynamic. Therefore, this is put to the video RAM where you have a very high bandwidth for graphical operations. We will, uh, in the following slides, let me say, follow the pixel 200, 100, so that we have one example pixel and see how this is created. This pixel would be then in the middle of this uh, speed gauge here and in the middle of the needle. Normally in, um, in such systems, you want to, or you need to manipulate your uh, images. Um, in our case, for sure, we want that the speed needle shows the actual speed of the vehicle. So we would receive the speed signal via CANFD, for example, and then calculate out of the speed signal the uh, rotation of the needle which is needed. And this rotated needle would then be sent to the display. We have uh, for the graphical operations the 2.5D engine. This is uh, part of this GFX core here. 
This is a so-called PLIT engine, which allows a lot of graphical operations. In our case, it will be just a rotation, also a 2D rotation, not a 3D rotation, like in the example before. So this uh, engine has a fetch unit, which took the information, the pixel information out of the EVAM here from our needle, fetch it, then there is a rotation done. The store unit stores the result back into the video RAM. The uh, 2.5D engine knows which commands it needs to be executed out of a command list, which is stored in, stored in VRAM and it just works through this lines of commands. Okay. So now we have our rotated needle. And we need now bring this to the display. The main point here is the video IO. And the video IO um, consists of an, in the first part of a composition engine. And the composition engine is the part where the final pixel information is, uh, is created, is composed by uh, fetching all the different parts together. So one part for sure would come from the background. So we have here one fetch unit, which fetches the information from the background. The other fetch unit needs to fetch the information from the needle. And there could be for sure more fetch units if you have a more complicated scene. Now you can see here that I uh, made this part here in the VRAM a little bit more complicated because if you have an um, dynamic content like the needle here in our example, you would normally work with the front and the back buffer. This means the front buffer contains the finished needle, which you will show at this very moment. And in the back buffer, you can at the same time create a new scene. In our case here, you see the needle in the back buffer is created at this moment with a another angle as the front buffer. This approach is necessary um, to avoid visual artifacts because um, if you would read from a buffer in which is at the same time written, you would create visual artifacts which you want to avoid. You can already see that this approach um, takes a lot of uh, Viva memory, but we will take a deeper look on this later. The composition engine now has fetched the two pixels, as mentioned before, we look at pixel 200, 100. And um, now it needs to be decide, decide how it mixes these two um, pixels. This is called then a blend operation. There are a lot of different blend operation of combining the pixels. You can put several colors out. So there's a very wide variety you can do. But in our case, it's, uh, let me say, pretty simple because you want to have the needle on top of the background. So in our pixel position 200, 100, this would mean you take the pixel out of this needle and the pixel from the background would not be visible anymore. Now um, around this needle here, there's a black background, which is only chosen to show that this is the size of the picture. In reality, this black area here would have a color information of transparency, of full transparency. This means if a blend mode put it on top of the background, uh, the transparency would uh, then um, takes care that if the customer look at the display, you would see the background and the transparency would just disappear, right? Okay. So we can, we have now that the composition engine um, took the data and decided um, how the final pixel should look like. And this information now needs to go to the display. The next uh, step in this flow is the display engine. 
And the display engine now takes care about the timing and information um, synchronization with the display. So it adds synchronization information as vSync and hSync, and it also, also has a FIFO in it so that this display engine output could then be in time with the display time. The output of this display time, uh, engine is a parallel RGB. Uh, since we have an LVDS display, this means we need also an FTP link. This FTP link takes the parallel RGB information, serialized this according to the FTP link standard, send it out to the uh, pins, and the LVDS uh, display can work with this information and show the content we want. This um, now takes a little bit deeper look on the decomposition uh, engine. So this alpha blending matrix we see here on this on this image, this is part of the composition engine. And as I mentioned before, you have several um, units which can read the information, the different fetch units. And this can be any kind of this yeah, content here. So you could have static windows like our background, which is normally an external flash and is compressed. There's not much change, there's just one image. Then you have this very dynamic content like our needle, like our needle, which is uh, handled with this front back buffer approach. Uh, as we mentioned before here, buff is this our 2.5D engine which writes in the back buffer and um, our composition engine catches from the front buffer the data. What we have now as a new feature and innovation in the Terveo second generation is that we have an on-the-fly based rendering. As you can already see, this is much smaller in the buffer size uh, as the front and back buffer approach, but as also um, can also handle very dynamic content and how this will work. This is explained in more detail in the next slides. We also uh, support warping on the fly. This means um, in head-up display, you have project normally on a curved windshield. This means your normal picture would be distorted by this, by this curving of the windshield. And therefore the image is corrected by the warping functionality to be then again in, a, in the right shape when you look at it. Now we have, let me say, the base to discuss this rendering um, options we have and explaining uh, what is IBO, LBO, and OTF. Here on the left side, on the bottom left side, you see the IBO. This is also what is available in the first generation and similar done in, in, in every other application. You have a front and a back buffer. The front buffer is shown and the back buffer is worked on. And this also means that our um, graphic engine would prepare the content of the back buffer. It would start at pixel zero, zero, and then go through this complete buffer. And in the end it's finished and it would go to the next task, um, whatever this is. For the Taveo second generation, one major improvement was that we added to the graphic pipeline uh, two more pipelines. So we have now three pipelines, which can also work in parallel but this needs to have a change in this, yeah, in the way we are doing this. Therefore, we um, we added this line-based operation in which um, here in the back buffer, which is worked on, um, we can work in slices. This means if the uh, 2D engine has finished one slice and there is in the pipeline a more um, urgent, uh, task with a higher priority. This could be interrupted here, paused here. The higher priority task can work on and then it can uh, jump back and uh, continue with this. But this also allows that 
this three pipelines work in parallel in this. So there's really the case normal that you have one pipeline working here, the second here, the third here. And then for sure you have a very much increased performance compared to the top of your first generation. Even if you work still with a front end back buffer approach. But you can also use this front end back buffer uh, this LBO approach and use our new functionality called OTF on the fly. In this case, we built up a kind of ring buffer with several lines, for example, 46, 128, something like this. And um, the display will read from this, the composition engine will read from this buffer, show, bring it to the display, then it jumps to the next line. And when this line here, the first line is finished, the uh, 2D engine can finish this line, jump above and work further on here. And then you have an always a ring buffer, which is continuously filled by the uh, by our 2.5D engine and is read out by the display. For sure, there is a communication between both of them so that it's clear and um, when the display uh, when the display is finished and the engine can, add new content and also to ensure that this, this ring buffer is not run empty. Okay, here is short, nice animation of our both uh, use cases. So this is the um, IBO mode where you have this classical approach. You have two buffers, the engine always writes to one and the other one is used by the display controller to create the image. And here you can see it's much more dynamic. <laughs> so you have really the 2.5D engine continuously creating lines which go into this line buffer, which works like a ring buffer. And the display controller uh, always fetches the different lines and bring it to the content. So you have a much smaller buffer with a continuously um, continuous workflow. Now we are taking this um, example we spoke before and bring it in our uh, example. So you can see here in the video RAM, we have uh, replaced the front and back buffer with the ODF buffer, which is much smaller. Here, this LBH, this is the line buffer handshake. This is the communication between VDUIO and the a graphic engine um, about the status of the swing buffer and when the graphics engine can produce new lines. Besides this, there is not much change from, from um, the user perspective, right? There's still the fetch unit fetching the data and, but you have this continuously work between these two units. This slide here is um, a marketing slide, but nevertheless, it shows a little bit uh, the, the differences or the influence of this new, new OTF functionality. Here you have three different display sizes down here. And in the dark gray, this is the normal frame buffer approach and this frame buffer approach needed medium spaces and at a certain display size uh, you come to the border of our systems of here four megabyte and then you would need to use for example the ddr variant where you, have, where you can go to much higher video RAM sizes or the other advantage is you work with our smaller video RAM size but you use otf and then you see the uh, line buffer for OTFs also increases, but for sure in a much other scale than um, for a normal frame buffer approach. This um, query here is a command list, which I mentioned before on, and normally you would always fill all the video RAM with source images since it's at the highest bandwidth, it just makes sense to, to have the uh, video RAM used as much as possible. Okay, there we are at the end of the hardware part. I hope uh, you get a first impression how our hardware works. 
and uh, so we can step now how the customer is using our graphic app. On the right side, you see what we, what Infineon's designs, we make an innovative hardware, we, we have a graphic driver, we have a user guide with tutorials, persons like me who support everyone with questions. And, um, but for sure the designer in the end, they do not want to read 300 pages API description. Their main focus is uh, to create a modern user interface um, for the customer. Yeah? And so normally they work with HMI tools like QT. So the um, designer is having this abstraction layer from the hardware and the software by using an HMI tool. And all this software environment application, graphics driver, AutoZar operation system, something like MCAL is um, not so much visible for them. But in the end, for sure, the generated code is compiled, linked, flashed in our internal flash. The graphic assets are normally uh, copied to something like a hyperflash, external hyperflash. And in the end, our MCU brings the intended result to the display. Yeah. And um, this brings us to the last point of the presentation about our HMI tool certification program. Because it's clear in this environment, it's very important that the HMI tool understands and uses our hardware and our API in the best possible way. Yeah? Otherwise you would really give up a lot of performance. And therefore we defined all the most important hardware we have. And um, for example, warping this OTF, the different rendering modes, also all this graphical operations like rotation, scaling, decompression, warping. So everything um, which is really important uh, made a kind of certification program that to ensure that the HMI tool uh, tools support all these features as intended. And um, to somehow verify this, the HMI tool vendors needed to uh, implement two demonstrators. One is a full virtual dashboard demo and a dual display head up solution with, with warping. The uh, virtual dashboard you can see here above. And this you also saw in the video I showed. This is from the certification program. So QT is a certified partner from us. And um, you can, for example, take a look on the video on YouTube. With the last slide of my presentation, I just want to make the point that for sure this HMI tool gives you an abstraction to our hardware. I mean, we have a hardware, we have a, a driver which is somehow complex, which has a something like an OTF, which in the end, you as a user do not need to completely understand or completely set every tool. Yeah? In the end, you make your layer like here and the OTF functionality is even preset. And it's in the end, it's just from the layer. You can see here, this is the layer. It's just one, one setting which is more or less transparent for you, right? So you see here the rendering hints is optimized for size. This means this in the end, the hardware is using OTF, but this is yeah, from your daily work as a user of the tool, this would be more or less transparent. Yeah. It's just a click away, this functionality. So this brings me to the end of the presentation. And I hope you get an initial idea how our MCU works. So in the end, the remaining is to wish you a wonderful rest of the day and um, bye.